welcome. Uh, this is a webcast uh, talking about how India and Australia tackle plastic waste. There are so many things uh, we have to talk about, so this is really exciting. I have a, a number of people uh, with me. Uh, Asa Doron, who is a professor at the ANU and an expert for waste in India. Sinat Nyasi, who is a director at Development Alternatives in, in Delhi, an expert on, on plastics and waste and circular economy more generally. Vina Shahashwala, who is with the University of New South Wales, uh, a professor, innovator and materials engineer. And Shuvik uh, Patacharya, who is with uh, Terry, the Energy and Resource Institute also in Delhi, where he's a director. Uh, myself, my name is Heinz Schandl. I'm with the CSRO in Canberra. And I have with me also Natasha Porter, also from the CSRO. What we like to do today is to talk about plastics waste in India. We want to tell you four stories, uh, share four experiences, and then uh, allow a little bit of time after each speaker to um, look at whether you had any questions, which Natasha would then summarize uh, for us and we get a, a quick response uh, from every speaker. So the first story um, will be presented by Sinat Niasi. She's a vice president at the Development Alternative Group in, in New Delhi. This is a really exciting um, a group that you're working with uh, CNAT, addressing uh, waste problems, both from a policy and the social point of view. And so I'm very, uh, very curious and interested to hear your story. Over to you, CNAT. Thank you. Thank you, Heinz. Thank you, everybody. And good morning from India. I know it's it's late afternoon in, in uh, Australia. So good afternoon um, to all of you from Australia. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, when Heinz asked me to speak on a story from uh, from an experience um, on the social end on, on with the, with people with ourselves, actually, uh, I decided that we would look at something that's uh, that we've been through a few years um, back and probably lays in a sense a base for a lot of the thinking on uh, um, uh, societal level management, if I may say, of, of the plastic uh, problem that we have. So I'll just share my screen very quickly and take you through a, a small story. Uh, it, it, uh, can you can you see my screen now? Okay, so um, it it may not look as if we are talking plastics, but the simplest and the most difficult step for plastics to be managed in the environment is really coming from uh, our homes and what we do to the waste that we generate. Uh, the there are more complex answers at the at the um, uh, societal, probably at the uh, institutional and policy levels, but we are starting from our homes uh, here. Uh, this is a small experiment that we did in 2015, which uh, brought a lot of lessons. Nothing very groundbreaking, if I may say, but but puts puts what we are. Uh, doing in plastic management in the country and everywhere else in the world in perspective from the consumer, uh, homeowner, and I'd say middle class family level. Uh, this incidentally is the highest mountain in New Delhi. This is a uh, Ghazipur landfill waste dump, which was um, uh, set up for a period of 25 years in I think 84, it continues to grow and um, has collapsed uh, in the past with fatalities. Uh, in 19, 2019, when this photograph was taken, it was 65 meters high. Uh, and uh, incidentally, uh, only eight meters short of the highest tower, which is uh, the um, Qutub Minar in Delhi and the Taj Mahal, which many of you may have seen or heard about. Uh, by 2021, of course, because 20, 2019, there was a big halabaloo, it had collapsed for some time and um, there, there was a process that was set up to, uh, to manage this, to take out to, to, with, with remediation 
uh, technologies, etc. And it went down to 53 meters uh, as of 2021. But a lot of this going down actually is not maths. It's geography, as they say, because it was uh, part of it was replaced in, in, an, in a new landfill that is coming up on the side. But the capacity to handle this waste uh, at the moment with all the equipment sitting there near the site is only about, um, I think, two and a half thousand metric tons um, a day. And we get about twice or three times as much, you know, that continues to flow in into the system. So nothing great the answer lies really in segregation at source because what we are doing and this is a picture from uh, one of the service providers of um, of home com of home composting uh, we we know that 60 percent of what goes into that uh, is actually something that can go back to the soils and and if that goes out then there is a lot that can be retrieved and it's because of that first mix that we actually have a whole lot of complication right up till the end. Uh, so we began in 2015 in this little small locality in, um, in New Delhi, it's called Saraswati Vihar. We chose a small section of it in E-Block. Saraswati Vihar was set up in 1970s as a, as a teacher's uh, neighborhood. It's, about, it's got about 1,000 plus families, uh, most of whom were university teachers or school teachers. Of course, over the years, the population has uh, sort of changed. There are many other, other um, occupations who are there, but generally it's a plotted um, locality. They have access to uh, terraces, uh, and now that they've grown, uh, more in more floors, you know, there are multiple floors. Some of them have balconies and some of them still have terraces. They all access their community park. Very important to understand they have access to space, which uh, enables them to look at using what they have in a different manner. So they have a relationship with that space. We uh, brought together in the beginning 50 families, uh, for families that um, uh, I think were the first pilot fund pioneers within that within that in, initiative and and over the years uh, over two years this grew to become 350 families in that uh, in that uh, neighborhood alone this uh, 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 we, we have to understand that this is a very very typical middle class family uh, set of people who uh, understand waste as uh, uh, whatever they can retrieve and uh, they are upwardly mobile uh, and as they're moving and uh, you know this is a, just a snapshot of what you see on your screen as the kind of families that we were we were working with and of course the the equipment that they were working with eventually to manage their wastes at home something that they could put in into their balcony the size of a lpg gas cylinder literally uh, very handleable uh, and manageable but this uh, let's just take a step back when we when we came to uh, meet them this is what was happening in their colony despite the fact that you know middle class at middle class attitudes uh, you know something that we've been taught from the times of our grandmothers is that you have to reuse you have to extend life you have to save and even then only what you see in the green the newspaper and glass bottles were the most were, were the stuff that they were actually monetizing they were uh, making sure that they were collected and sold. Some, very few, were able to monetize what you see in orange, which is you know stuff that comes out of your shampoo bottles, oil bottles, etc. Some uh, plastic packaging, which could be uh, cleaned up and used again, uh, and maybe taken by the by the kawariwala. Some metal, but most of it was thrown. And because they were only managing ten percent. Uh, of their hole, actually the hole was going into, into that landfill that you saw. It took, us, it took us quite some time, two years, from what you see in the first picture to what you see in the last picture. Uh, to be fair, there were already enthusiasts which were kitchen gardeners, who were kitchen gardeners who were not, however, connected, connecting the, what they were producing on their terraces to what they were producing as waste in their kitchens. And uh, it was bringing these two things together that became important for us. Uh, but this journey of two years, uh, you know, didn't begin 
didn't begin, it wasn't easy. It meant we were doing house to house, a very passionate uh, young team went house to house, oftentimes to very um, uh, suspicious uh, families, very uh, with doors banged on our faces. Uh, uh, you can see this third picture, you know, you, you stay apart till you could actually i'm meeting them at odd hours i mean meeting them when when the when the uh, flight person comes down uh, home at <laughs> at uh, nine in the night uh, uh, meeting them in the parks making friends uh, talking with their children uh, breakthrough started coming in to us when we connected with and we could convince their resident welfare association the base institution that was that was regularly talking to the communities uh, and bringing them together for a variety of other reasons. Most of the time, it would be cultural, religious reasons that the community would come together for. Uh, introducing them to what we saw uh, till the time they let us into their homes. And, and we were in their homes, talking to them, writing, filling forms, trying to, trying to explain to them what is happening to their waste as we were making this awareness. Uh, the, like I mentioned, the breakthrough was the RWA. The breakthrough was then demonstrating, uh, getting into their schools, and eventually uh, the negotiations on, in the park on registering for this equipment. Uh, an important thing was that this equipment had a price. Uh, and a middle class family, this, I mean, it's, it's not a very expensive thing. It's, it's a very, very small amount, but they are very, very careful with what they spend. And I think uh, getting over that bump in the first, uh, first year became uh, a break, again, the next breakthrough that they put in, they said, okay, we are ready to invest a little bit to, to try. And um, uh, the whole process of once the trials began was with intensive handholding, training, reviewing, sharing their little successes, uh, and 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 putting them out into the into the co community space to say, look, so and so has done this, uh, celebrating their uh, gardeners and connecting them to the local councillors and as the RWA and to the local government. From from fifty, we moved to. 350 because there are quite a few others who wanted to join who didn't have space or weren't very comfortable in doing this at home and so we actually moved to a community level uh, composting for the remainder which was built together with them and we had a, a very very high level of participation uh, which is not seen in Delhi middle class urban families uh, to come together to do this uh, together to join and, and at least wasn't seen then uh, to put up a uh, community level composting system. And what changed in two years was that from what we saw 10% in the beginning, you could see at homes all that is now green. So the kitchen crap, uh, scraps, they were able to uh, retrieve what they were throwing into their, into their mixed bag for textile shoes, electrical items that could go, all of the recyclables could be removed. Uh, we, we had a few who were also moving into looking at no, uh, low value stuff, but there still is, are, are, is areas of concern. And uh, we also saw them connected to the service providers in the, look, in the, in the city who could continue to help them uh, to continue this habit uh, that they could provide, that they, they, they were doing. Uh, and the next level, so you know now, of course, it's something new. Many cities in the, in the, in the country are doing this. Many neighborhoods are doing this. Although if, if, we, if we want, we can count them maybe on two hands or three hands in Delhi of the number of neighborhoods that might still be composting and making sure that they are segregating at home. There are technologies that exist both at home level and at community level, which are far more advanced than what we had begun with. There are service providers that, that are starting to mushroom. Uh, and in some cities, like we know in Gurgaon, there are also connections with the um, uh, city government who is uh, able to access this compost uh, and all to uh, use it in their municipal parks and gardens. So there is a, there is a uh, movement that is there, yet we see that the, that the Ghazipur landfill is still filling up. So there is obviously a very, very small percentage of people who have reached uh, uh, to this level and there's that much more to be done. And this is really the first step. Uh, and what we, what we 
uh, but this is really my last slide that you know what we found that it's uh, the for the family for for the for this middle class family that that's saving every penny that it wants that it can it's it is about prioritizing health and safe living but it's also about and it is also about breaking mental barriers to say look this is a waste but it has value there's a there's a very big taboo associated with with the waste that you generate in the country but at the as you break mental barriers it's about convenience affordability the system that brings in your services and affordability to that but and in and finally it's about inspiring learning and connecting connecting at the emotional level connecting at the societal level but connecting to institutions and connecting to the service so if we are able to establish these connects we find that at least 60 percent can go back to soil and the after remainder 40 percent you can actually recycle almost 30 percent that comes out of your home so it's it's really a very tiny percentage that we are then talking about that needs uh, a, a concern uh, that needs an, uh, to be addressed so thank you for that i hope i managed to keep in time uh, almost you. Uh, you almost kept to time cnet and I'm, I'm kind of thinking um with the next speaker, uh, I'm going to just jump in and say thank you at some point. This is a fascinating story. And I guess as soon as the organic material is uh, out of the waste stream, we can actually start to use the plastics, the polymers, the cans, the metals. Uh, so a very important step. And thank you for sharing this CNET. And we're moving on to Asa, Asa Daron, um, who is with the Australian National University. You have written a couple of books uh, see I know about, but maybe there are more. Uh, you call yourself an urban anthropologist uh, who goes to places and tries to understand uh, what people are doing. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear your story as well. Welcome, Asa. Hello, Asa. You have to unmute yourself, Asi. Thank you, Heinz, and thank you for the panelists and to AII for hosting this fantastic uh, panel. And, and it's, it's nice to see that there are some other people who love waste uh, as much as I do. And as you can see, as much as uh, uh, my co-conspirator uh, conspirator Robin Jeffrey and I have been working on waste for some years now. And this is a bit of a revelation for us. And uh, today I want to talk to you about a little bit about the overall picture, but kind of try starting to focus more on plastics and the kind of um, ways we engage with plastics. So India's relationship with waste, as you all know, has markedly changed uh, uh, over the years. We remember Gandhi's uh, practices of frugality and husbanding that were very much wide uh, spread. Actually, you can move the slides because I don't control the slides here. So I don't know what, uh... yeah, just leave this one. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So yeah, um, these have been replaced by people that are now enthusiastically embracing uh, consumerism, throwaway society. What you see in this slide, which I hope you can see because I'm not sure, is one of Sean Mendes' um, uh, remarkable paintings. He's a Baroda artist. And um, it's a kind of snakes and ladders that demonstrates that the kind of, um, I don't know what's, can you? Yeah, now you can see it, I think. That demonstrate the kind of consumer enthusiasm that has taken India by storm since uh, the economic reforms of the 1990s. The kind of huge magnitude and composition of waste in India has changed dramatically. And this is what the book that Robin Jeffrey and I were trying to kind of um, understand how India uh, is changing its relationship with waste. You know, a population of over 1.3 billion people, very densely populated, about 40% of them living in, in uh, urban areas. And there's been a steep rise in all sorts of things from buildings to infrastructure products to producing uh, enormous amounts of waste from construction, demolition debris, uh, new volumes of waste from agriculture, um, mines, factories, and so on. 
But what do people always notice is plastic. Because plastic is so visible, it really captures the imagination. It's so prevalent. And if you can move one slide, please. It's, it's part of our everyday life, right? We don't only shed our hair when we are in the course of grooming ourselves and growing old. We also shed plastics. We wear plastics, we sit on plastics. Our world is saturated by plastics. You can see here two images that, uh, you know, this is a protest in Villa Pishala in uh, South India, uh, um, um, which was a, a big kind of lightning, uh, lightning road around. A, a landfill that was uh, near Trivandrum or uh, uh, at the time, or on the right, you see a pan masala dukan, again, full of different forms of plastics. So it saturates our lives. We even have it in our clothes, in our tea bags, cosmetic products, uh, cups, uh, toothpaste, mobiles, as, as you can, if you move one more slide, a few more images from India to kind of illustrate that how plastic has become enemy number one, as it were, right? We are plastic carriers. We are the vehicles for the spread of plastic everywhere. From single-use plastics, you can see it in, in huge gatherings in India, like the Kumela, you know, all the, the gatherings there, or plastic bags, uh, the tons of plastics that uh, with the flowers for worshiping that are put in the rivers. The question is how we can handle those plastics. And the point that we are making is that we can't handle them alone. We need institutions. We need proper institutions to handle those plastics, whether it's government or NGOs. We also need global regulations to limit the illegal dumping of plastics in India and to ensure that there are some kind of laws that apply across borders, right? So we need to ensure also that the pet petroleum giants uh, stop turbocharging uh, this kind of infinite demand for plastics in both uh, military and uh, medical and civilian use. But you know these are topics that need addressing at various scales and levels. And what I want to kind of focus from now on until uh, with the few minutes I've got left is what happens with the plastic we've already got in front of us. How is it handled in India itself? And if you can move a slide. Are you able to? Yeah. So this is, for example, in Dharavi, in Mumbai, people of uh, it's a well-known uh, area where recycling takes place. Is the, the was walking on the roofs there, and just a picture to give you a sense of the magnitude and that everything is saturated by plastic. And another picture, if you move another slide, please. Yep. One more you can see the people who are actually recycling the plastics. And plastic is many things to many people. And as you can see here are plastic cups, disposables. Or if you move another one, another slide to give you a sense of the kind of diversity of plastics that require a specific handling and recycling. Not all plastics are the same. So if you can move another slide, Yeah, so here you can see the different types of bottles that are organized and different, uh, and different uh, uh, kind of um, electronic uh, types of waste. Another slide forward, please. And now I wanna kind of talk to you about the people who collect those plastics. Who are they? So in India, the people who collect plastics are people that belong to the underprivileged classes. Uh, those are of course, um, colored by a uh, caste, class, uh, prejudice that underpins this kind of uh, uh, discrimination against what some people have called the wasted underclasses of Dalits or landless laborers, migrants, and poor Muslims. Now, these groups make the reserve army of unskilled laborers. And they often live, as we saw in Zinat's um, uh, um, um, PowerPoint with uh, Ghazipur, but in other landfills, they, li they live in proximity to these uh, uh, landfills or rubbish piles that are generated by the consumer, consumer middle classes. And attitudes to these kind of uh, waste are rarely, uh, rarely something that we, we, we considered. How, how do these people 
uh, deal with waste? How do they handle this? And what we've tried to demonstrate is that it all is a very much involves a very large waste pyramid, as it were. And at the bottom of this waste pyramid are those uh, disadvantaged groups. And of course, this, this cuts across genders and interplays of classes and castes. If you could move one more. Some of the processing that takes place near these landfills and, and areas of slum involves middlemen, these uh, kabariwalas that um, uh, you can see um, in, the, in the picture here, they buy, they purchase uh, from the waste pickers the various plastics and other types of waste. And then these, and then they sell it up uh, uh, higher in the pyramid to be sorted. Next slide, please. Yeah, next one, please. Just trying to uh, give you uh, uh, um, some images about who are the people who are sorting and creating the value here. And the rise in the value of these plastics as, as it is handled and sorted is in some ways at odds with the kind of stagnant condition of those people who handle it, right? Those people that you see are migrants, as I said, or landless laborers, uh, uh, disadvantaged classes that are vulnerable, that are at risk, that are working in very harsh environments. And, uh, uh, and while they sort out the waste and move it up the pyramid, they remain at the bottom. So the waste gains value where these people do not. If you can move, uh, one more slide, there, please. There are no more slides I'll see Sorry, in the slideshow. <laughs> it stopped at the slide where you saw the plastic burning. But maybe you want to make a final point. Oh, OK. So I think that um, what I wanted to say about uh, uh, the technologies uh, that you saw in the final image is really about how we need to adopt appropriate technologies. In many cases, municipal authorities that are trying to deal with the massive amounts of waste, they, they, they really go for the quick fixes, right? These civic bodies are under-resourced and underpowered, and, and of course, they're subject to uh, mani manipulations, whether political or economic, and they need the support of these, these people, these, uh, uh, the, the staff and appropriate technology to ensure that recycling and the management of, of these waste systems work. So the, I think, what we're trying to say is that technology alone won't necessarily, it, it plays an important role, but it, it, it needs to come along alongside with the, a more uh, meaningful solutions that draw on the experiences of those waste pickers and those people who handle and have the expertise and will get the rewards and will get the kind of uh, protection mechanisms that they can continue to work with waste. The danger for us, as we saw it, is when you apply one single technical organizational solutions like you saw with that truck incinerator that are supposed to work everywhere, you, have, you often forget that there's different types of waste in different places need to apply different kinds of solutions because this is a complicated, as they say, a wicked, a wicked problem. And, and what, what will work maybe in North India in particular conditions will not necessarily work in the south and places like uh, Tamil Nadu or Kerala. So technologies and quick fixes are one of the key issues that we identified that we, um, we think needs to be uh, much, uh, much more considered before it is applied wholesale in India. Thank you and sorry for the, uh, for the um, slides because I couldn't see the slides as they were going. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'll see if we could see the slides, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I think um, we have a, a really nice uh, follow on in, in a moment. Uh, before that, I would just like to mention, um, please engage with the chat. Uh, there are, are questions uh, that participants are asking. I think there's a question for you, Sinat, uh, around whether the plastic waste management system uh, can be extended to other areas. So if you wouldn't mind to, uh, to also answer these questions in the chat function. And I'd like to hand over to Vina. Vina, you are an, an innovator and inventor. And I think when you see 
a, a plastic material, you immediately see the value in it and what could come of it. So the, this enormous amount of plastic that Asi showed us, maybe that's not enough plastic that you uh, could actually deal with. So over to you, Vina, for, for your story, please. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Heinz, uh, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, to present as part of uh, this uh, fantastic uh, event that you have. Um, so you're absolutely right. I think from our point of view, we really are looking, um, you know, at the Smart Center at UNSW, um, very much trying to see the value in waste. But to be able to see the value in waste, you also have to have a recognition that there are complex mixtures of uh, different kinds of materials uh, that um, waste, of course, entails. And so when we talk about, um, you know, plastics, we have to also bear in mind that sometimes the complexity lies with the fact that we've got mixtures of um, metals and plastics. And I'm going to try and just see if I can share this screen of mine with you. I wanted to uh, put the slide up because when I talk about mixtures, you know, it's this everyday example, something we sleep on every night, right? And you might say, well, where's the plastic in here? <laughs> but in, in mattresses, uh, it's, it's a fabulous sort of example of a product, this everyday obvious product that has got, um, of course, metal in it, as we all know, um, steel. Uh, but then what do you do with all of the the polymers that are there in uh, in these kinds of materials. So whether it's in the foam or indeed in textiles, um, you know, and typically, of course, people will just assume um, that, OK, well, it is really only money to be made out of that steel. So, of course, um, you know, people will try and separate that out, go and sell steel for the metallic value. But the question that we're really, um, you know, asking is when you've got mixtures where plastics and metals present themselves, you really don't want to take the approach where, um, you're burning away plastic simply to extract value. In fact, if we can look at the transformation that can occur with different kinds of uh, plastic materials, um, then you can see that as enhancing value both by looking at metallics as well as non-metallics. So this picture here that um, uh, with my colleague Anirban that I've got on the slide is showing when we were visiting uh, this Kimbriki. It's, um, it's a council run site uh, north of Sydney. Um, and, and what you can see here again, as you see in, in landfills and, and many parts of the world, of course, in this case, it's close to home. It's uh, not too far from, uh, from uh, University of New South Wales. But the reason why I wanna put that up is it's the same global challenge. So when you look at, um, again, something like this, I want to again put up a picture where I uh, wanted to sort of just uh, pick up on, uh, you know, some of those photos that I think Zenith was sharing with us earlier, that uh, it's it's not just a challenge in India, but in Australia and many, many parts of the world that when you've got, um, you know, complex materials, and, and I know I gave examples of uh, waste mattresses, but then, you know, you can sort of start to see in so many different ways, and you talk about our furniture waste, for instance, again, there would be, um, you know, some uh, non-metallics then there'd be some wood and metal and then you can get into electronic waste and again you've got with e-waste there's valuable metals like copper but then you've also got plastics as a non-metallic so in this case uh, you'll see um, uh, this um, truck in the middle and and all these piles of waste again at one of our industry partners um, in in Australia in the state of New South Wales uh, not too far about uh, four and a half hours drive from Sydney in uh, a place called Kudamandra it's a regional town and one of our solutions are technologies that we've deployed. And I'll sort of leave some of those thoughts with you at the end around micro factories that really show that it is absolutely possible to take waste resources like what we're talking about here with uh, both metallics, non-metallics and, and textiles. And of course, the list goes on and on. Uh, and that's why, of course, piles of these wastes can grow if you only kind of focus on metallics or if you only focus on nice single clean streams of, of PET water bottles. But what we've got to recognize is there are opportunities and value to be had. Um, and so the reason why we've partnered with this particular company you see in the middle there, the truck that he's going around collecting waste mattresses and tires is because there are lots of people in the world and I think those examples are really important examples where I think we need to start to see entrepreneurs, people who work in the world of waste and waste recycling as entrepreneurs who are simply their first step doing really well, collecting 
um, these waste resources, but where it can really add value and, and really recognize the value of work in creating value added products is rewarding um, their work as environmental entrepreneurs. And so this is an example here with this particular small business collecting waste, but now as a result of manufacturing is really adding more value to their business. So all of those examples that uh, we saw earlier, uh, whether in outskirts of Delhi or indeed in, um, in, in, indeed in, in um, you know, Mumbai, where we've got, of course, examples where we know that uh, the waste warriors uh, work extremely hard. It's a great service to our community. But how do we make sure that they're rewarded in a fair manner is by really showing that if transformation of waste into value can be done, um, can be delivered, then of course, that then enables us to create more green jobs and green jobs where, where uh, wages are paid in a way that we recognize that the manufacturing of these value added products um, have a market. And, and that's really what we are showing. Um, these examples of Kudamandra, where we are transforming these uh, waste resources into highly engineered products. So let me give you an example of what we're doing with our waste plastics. And, and if people are interested, a lot of this detail is there on our Smart Centers website. Uh, but what you're seeing here on the screen is waste plastics coming from uh, e-waste, so you know, printers and a lot of the, the typical hardware that we all have in our offices, in our homes, uh, what we have done, um, and, and our micro factories at UNSW are producing these plastic filaments. You see these plastic filaments and um, you know, uh, acknowledge our team, um, a fabulous uh, micro factory team headed by Anirban, um, you know, running, running this fantastic, um, you know, uh, showcasing the example, but also it's going now beyond research and research translation and showing that we do need to translate these technologies into practice. And what you're seeing those plastic filaments now made out of 100% plastics um, being used as feedstock for 3D printing. And the reason why I want to share this with you is one of the the earliest sort of products that we made uh, back in 2017. Uh, in fact, I think one of our very first products uh, was indeed what you're seeing on the screen being printed there, uh, replicas, these uh, replicas of um, Mahatma Gandhi's um, glasses. So it really is about showing that, um, you know what, it might be seen as a waste, that plastic waste, um, a complex uh, plastic, of course, um, people might in fact be challenged by how we recycle it. But the point I wanted to make here about this going beyond recycling and talking about reforming is exactly this. It's reformed into plastic filaments that then has been used as a feedstock for uh, 3D printing. And of course, now we print all kinds of products in our micro factories. So, but if you can imagine in the future, all of these kinds of micro micro um, operations and businesses could be set up where the waste is being collected, uh, whether it is in, in, in Taravi or, or Silampur, indeed, uh, a couple of places that uh, uh, we've, we've really had the, um, the, the, really the privilege of going and seeing firsthand. Uh, I think it is important that as researchers, we, we actually connect with communities, with businesses to understand where the needs are. And I think that's exactly what we're doing at the Smart Center. So these examples are really allowing us to show, um, of course, what is possible. So we were again in the privileged position to be invited as part of an Australia India partnership. Um, back in 2017, we were asked to, on behalf of UNSW, attend this uh, knowledge partnership between Australia and India. Um, and, and of course, some of the earliest examples of these these Mahatma Gandhi glasses uh, were gifted um, to Prime Minister Modi for us. It's an inspiration to really show that these decentralized facilities are indeed delivering uh, value to our communities by seeing how waste can indeed be transformed um, and to, to be able to create all kinds of uh, products. So, um, you know, if you were to have a sneak peek into our micro factories, uh, this is what we are really um, seeing inside a micro factory. You might have all kinds of modules. Um, and indeed for us, um, you know, there's no such thing as uh, uh, impossible waste. Uh, we just sort of see this as, as a fantastic uh, opportunity and indeed a challenge. So let's start to, of course, think about these as resources um, and, and what is really there uh, stopping us now in converting resources into value-added products is the ability 
to one, empower people, empower communities. So these types of micro factory modules can actually be located. It's affordable, accessible technology and being located in the hands of um, those entrepreneurs, those waste warriors um, who can actually create all kinds of products. So you can imagine in the future, um, you know, having, for example, 3D printers that are now becoming more and more affordable, having these kinds of plastic filaments uh, that can uh, provide this as, a, as an opportunity. Um, and so I just want to finish off by saying that this is really where uh, the value um, of, uh, of micro factories comes in. It's really about showing they are, they are creating innovative product solutions. They can be customized to where the community needs are. Um, and indeed, uh, we want to be able to show that the most important outcome in all of this is creating those local green jobs and, and indeed, of course, uh, delivering economic benefits. Um, so from an environmental and a social point of view, I think it is important when we start to think about this in a holistic manner, bringing in science, technology, and engineering um, so that communities can be empowered, small businesses and, and environmental entrepreneurs can really showcase uh, that, that all of that waste that's being collected um, uh, can deliver value. Um, so I'm conscious of time, I'll leave it at that. Lots of other exciting solutions are there on our website if you want to have a look at uh, Smart Center's website at UNSW. So, um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, uh, Heinz, for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you, Vina. And, and this is as fascinating as I thought it would be. Um, you could say, um, you know, like once the organic stuff is out, we have sorted and clean waste. And Asi has shown us what then happens and how that's related actually to, to the social structure in India. And then all the waste is uh, collected and you turn it into filaments immediately and into a product. And that's where it really happens, where the value is created, as you said, Vina. And so a fantastic example. Thank you for this. Thank you. And I'd like to move to Shuvik. Uh, so Shuvik, you lead uh, an integrated policy analysis division in the Energy and Resource Institute in Delhi. So I'm, I'm imagining that you have to post talk to policymakers who uh, provide the conditions and the industry who can put things in place, uh, both large industry, but also small and medium enterprises that may use the micro factory approach that Wiener has uh, presented to us. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to um, share with us your experience as well, Shuvik, that would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Hans. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, invitation, and uh, uh, and it's a good initiative uh, in terms of uh, sharing some of the work that the different institutes and organizations are working uh, around the space of uh, sustainable consumption and production. So uh, maybe uh, if I can share my screen. So I hope it's visible. Yeah, great. So uh, just to set the context and uh, maybe in terms of uh, explaining it through numbers, although uh, uh, my uh, earlier speakers have already like shared uh, in terms of the, the quantum of the problem, so far the plastic waste is concerned, but still to put those uh, into uh, some quantified estimates, uh, India generates around like 14.5 million tons of uh, plus uh, gen consumes around 14.5 million tons of plastics. But if we look at the kind of uh, consumption, it is the packaging which actually has the significant share around 24%. And uh, if we look at the kind of wastes uh, which are being generated, uh, particularly within a year, uh, it's around like uh, 25,000 uh, tons uh, per day and uh, which translates into around 5.6 million tons uh, per year. So you can think that it's almost like 9,000 Asian elephants or maybe 86 uh, Boeing 747 jets. And, uh, and bulk of these uh, wastes are generated in like uh, uh, most of the metropolitan cities uh, like the Delhi, Mumbai, uh, the Kolkata, Chennai, and Bangalore and Hyderabad. So uh, plastics are uh, the most critical part of uh, the entire problem that we are trying to address is the packaging because that is the short leaf ones, which is produced, which is consumed immediately, having a very limited shelf life, comes back out of the system and like ends up either in uh, the landfill or getting reincinerated or to some extent uh, recycled. At least uh, 
for some of the uh, plastic materials, we see that the recycling rates are relatively high compared to the ones which are like not so attractive to the recyclers. And that's where it actually lands up at the landfill. So you can see the kind of like major packaging solutions and applications uh, uh, used across different product categories. But here it's largely the beverage packaging. But yes, food packaging also has a huge uh, contribution uh, where the plastic is extensively used. And you can see that uh, in case of uh, PET, uh, it's largely the food products and the the non-alcoholic as well as the alcoholic beverages, uh, which contribute almost like uh, 73% uh, of the total application of PT going into the packaging segment. Now, uh, why did we are uh, uh, processing most of our polymers, but yes, most of the feedstock are like imported, uh, and this is the virgin process. Uh, but at the same time, you can look at uh, the, the discussion that we were having in the last couple of minutes in terms of how much of this entire plastics which is produced is going into the, the packaging segment and largely in the, the flexible packaging segment. And you can understand the flexible packaging in terms of the carry bags or even the, the, the cutlery items or even the cups and other uh, similar stuff, which is like consumed and, uh, and disposed of immediately then and there. And in the absence of like any kind of a, uh, appropriate uh, quantum available at selected locations, it largely uh, 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 is not recycled, right? It's like end up uh, in, the, in the various uh, recycling facilities. And what are the challenges if we really look uh, at the kind of like post-consumer plastic challenges? It is the infrastructure, which is a kind of a bigger problem. And uh, as Vina had mentioned, that uh, because of the collections, uh, because of the consumption are taking place at different locations, it is the responsibility of uh, the municipalities, the local urban bodies who are uh, managing these wastes as of now. But yes, I will discuss upon some of the few rules which uh, we have actually uh, uh, kind of like worked or uh, developed jointly with the ministry, at least uh, uh, a couple of the, the nodal ministries who are responsible for addressing these kind of uh, uh, plastic wastes. Uh, but uh, understanding like going back to the fundamental problem, so obviously the, the collection is a, a kind of a, a major problem. We have lack of recycling and uh, processing facilities and more so in the form of like they are available in, in a centralized format, in a decentralized approach is like currently missing and which to a large extent can have the potential to address some of the local level problems of uh, waste littering, waste ending up at the landfill which could have easily been addressed if we have these decentralized uh, uh, management uh, facilities. Further, uh, if we look at, and that is also the consequence we see in terms of poor rinse, the recycling rate, at least uh, for most of the polymers except PET, which has a pretty high uh, recycling rate of uh, 90%. Uh, and, and that's where we need solutions. And when we talk of solutions, it is the solutions, for example, in the form of uh, chips, preparing chips uh, uh, in the form of like preparing uh, a garbage bag, in the uh, 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 addressing the food bag, one-time use of sachets and the sanitary waste and the and the diaper. So these are the kind of like broad category of products which are currently produced in India. Uh, you can look at uh, the PET bottles currently being used mostly in the apparel segment. And, uh, but there are also some uh, emerging applications coming in the form of uh, 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 household items, including the carpets, the upholstery, the hosiery items, uh, even certain kind of toys uh, and other uh, uh, non-critical uh, products uh, for packaging applications. Uh, these kind of uh, granulated uh, recycled pets are uh, finding application. Although there is a kind of a, a, a strong research and development happening in this space of uh, uh, introducing bio-based products, which possibly can disintegrate uh, uh, after they are consumed. Now, uh, there are in a, a federal structure a whole lot of policies uh, and Terry has been working with uh, uh, the ministry in terms of providing inputs, guidelines, what is going to work and what is not going to work. Uh, unfortunately, we have been like, uh, 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 looking at a kind of proliferation in the number of central policies which make the situation all the more complicated. Uh, we have the, the plastic waste management rules which came in 2011, which was kind of uh, dismantled and again a kind of a, a, a new rule came in 2016 and 2018, 
uh, that was amended with the introduction of the extended producer responsibility. And finally, in 2021, we see uh, a kind of a draft regulation, which uh, has been focusing on doing away with all the form of single-use plastics in a phased manner over the next one, one and a half years. Uh, at the same time, uh, in terms of the implementation of the plastic waste management rules, what is important is that how uh, the how the producers are able to really uh, actively participate in terms of addressing this problem. And that is where this entire extended producer responsibility uh, uh, comes in. So EPR is basically a kind of a, a practice uh, uh, a policy approach in which the producers are made responsible uh, for collecting uh, Re recycling and bringing those uh, recycled material back into the system. And uh, initially, it was a kind of a big challenge uh, because uh, whatever we uh, understand working with different uh, manufacturers is that the collection, because uh, the wastes are not segregated, it becomes very difficult to, uh, in fact, get those huge volume of like plastics which are reaching the end of life uh, to the pr uh, processing facilities which can be recycled. And that is where we see the kind of like role of the, the uh, producer responsibility organizations coming up in a big way. Uh, and, and it makes, and the policies make a very specific uh, 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 role of the producer responsibility organizations who can support the companies, the brand owners, the producers, the importers in terms of meeting the, the kind of obligations that they have uh, so far the, uh, uh, so far the uh, recycling targets uh, for the uh, uh, plastic for these producers are concerned. So as you can see that uh, largely the uh, the PROs work with the collectors, with the waste bags, with the sorters and the bailers and the recyclers. Uh, and uh, finally, all they do is basically to see that this entire reverse logistics is done in a manner which is uh, scientifically uh, uh, sound, uh, which is in compliance with the uh, rules that are set by the Ministry of Environment, uh, the Nodal Ministry, and at the end, uh, it can actually validate the, coming, uh, the amount of like uh, waste which are being collected and recycled, and also by different uh, type of uh, polymers. So finally, what we see is that this is working, but, at, uh, but the situation is at a very nascent stage. So we still have like a kind of a long way to go. Uh, but yes, uh, the only way we can address this problem is the EPR way because of the very uh, uh, complex uh, kind of a, a waste situation that we see in India and uh, it needs no uh, uh, deliberations further given the kind of like uh, emphasis which uh, my earlier speakers have already mentioned. So what we intend uh, and we have been in fact engaging with the ministry to, to identify and explore how we can improve the imp implementation of the extended producer responsibility. And we look at five major ways. It's all about like strengthening the capacities of the implementing agencies. It is all about uh, coming up with a designing monitoring and evaluation framework, a draft monitoring and evaluation framework. We have already prepared and shared it. Uh, with the ministry and uh, hopefully in the in the draft notification when the, 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 the draft notification is revised possibly it will be taken into consideration uh, there is a need for an in-depth analysis of understanding what is working and what is not working and to in fact take a kind of note of all those which are not working and keep on improving the implementation process uh, there are a lot of epr schemes across different segments we have the e-waste we have the plastics is there a way in terms of harmonizing them? And finally, like uh, the kind of like guidelines for the future EPR schemes, because as I had already mentioned, it is like not a kind of a, 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 a cast in stone kind of a mechanism, but yes, uh, it needs to uh, work as we move on. So three aspects, formalization, technologies, and incentives, that is definitely going to support this implementation of the extended So thank, thank you, you. Thank you, thank you, Shuvik. Uh, that shows very clearly that good policy is, is very important. Um, so we had uh, four exciting talks. Uh, when in June 2020, uh, the Indian and the Australian Prime Minister met in their virtual meeting, they dedicated uh, some funding to uh, joint research between Australia and India to look into, uh, can we end plastics waste? And I put into the chat a link to, uh, to the website where you can find information about this, 
this project. Um, and I, I'd like to ask um, a couple of uh, questions with a few minutes we still have, reflecting on the questions that also have come through the chat and really hoping for 90 second answers. And so starting with you, Sinat, um, can we upscale the kind of initiatives uh, that you have shown? Uh, Heinz, absolutely. I think it's very possible. We we see the mushrooming of this, but uh, but as as we uh, as I'm studying more in this arena, I realize one very important thing that a bottom up initiative needs to have connections uh, and uh, yeah, with with the top down processes. It so that's that's step number one. You know the RWAs, for example, are the ideal bridge institutions. They connect the ground and the top, but they are not empowered. That's number one. And I think the other thing which uh, Asa had mentioned, it's a huge mind shift, mind uh, set shift, uh, which is so ingrained in our system. And in two seconds, the onion peel that I'm cutting in my kitchen is quite all right, as long as it's on my kitchen um, uh, platform. The moment it goes into the dustbin, I don't even want to put my hand in to pick it out again. So my, so the association with waste is so deep down in, in my gut. And, and I say my, I say, you know, 80% of Indian men, women, and uh, that it's, it's, it's something that you really have to take it out that it's not dirt. Mm. The whole terminology is wrong. It's not dirt. It's value. Thank you, thank you, Sinat. So Asi, does that mean we can formalize the informal sector, give them some job security and some um, labor standards and thereby change the way we think about waste in India? Thanks, Heinz. And I think Zinat's point was very, very spot on about the nature of waste and how it's conceived in India. And yes, I think there are, there have been efforts to formalize the so-called informal sector. And this needs to be done in the state level, municipality level. I, I think the, the, the question that we found out was, was the pertinent one was, how do you actually uh, uh, train these people? How do you ensure that they stay in those positions? How do you ensure that they receive the protective gear and dignity that they are required in order to continue to work as a formalized force and give them the provisions that are needed for that, like uh, pensions and like holidays and so on. So yes, formalizing is certainly something we should aim for, but this should not come at the expense of the millions of informal laborers that are still there trying to make ends meet. Thanks, Asi. The, um, the organizers have told me we only have one minute left. Um, see, uh, Vina, in, in, in one minute, is there a micro factory already operating in India? Um, Heinz, uh, we certainly can say that we've got micro factories operating in Australia. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but certainly not in India, no. Uh, we've had uh, people who've approached us and have expressed an interest, um, but I think it's, it's always nice to be able to kind of look to what we've done in Australia as an example of the fact that it's, it's now up and running, as I was giving that example of uh, you know, places like Kudamandra. Um, also, it goes to show that it can be done where it can make quality products um, and it can actually make products that are um, competitive um, in terms of quality. And so I think to me and pricing, of course. Um, so I think that's hopefully that's what we wanted to be able to get started on our journey um, where we can show with funding from the state government here that we received through the uh, physical sciences funding to initiate that. Um, and so hopefully that will have a little bit more information on that, but uh, some of that is already there on our website uh, of Smart Center. Thank you, Vina. Uh, so we are kicked out of our room two minutes early. A big thank you to Shuvik, Asi, Natasha, Asina, and, and Vina. Um, please stay connected. Thank you to the participants for listening in today. Um, obviously, we would like to have a much more human interaction, uh, not just virtual. So uh, please be in touch with our speakers, um, keep these connections going, and let's work to reduce not just plastic waste, but waste more generally. 
thank you very much and very nice to meet you. Thank you to Melbourne University and good luck to the rest of India week.